Hey, everybody. Professor Sorensen here. Uh, forgive that we are having to do this particular lecture via a YouTube video. I was stuck in St. Peter's for pretty much the whole day on Wednesday. Didn't know what the hell was going on. Had a pain in my gut. Thought it might have been a hernia. Turns out it's not. Turns out that it is a bacterial infection. And how that happened, I don't have the first idea. So I am on antibiotics. I am laying low <laughs> by the power of the antibiotics. They make you sleepy. But I think slowly but surely they're working because I have less of that itchy infection feeling and more of that sore, tired healing feeling. So I do believe good things are happening. That said, like the little splash page alluded to, we're going to do four things today. One, you're getting a five-minute version of going over the websites and where all the resources are, okay? We're not going to do it every time, trust me. We are going to start class with five minutes of a little bit of administrative. We're going to remind you about computer science clubs. I'm going to remind you about the CAPS tutors and the resources. I'm going to remind you about the cage. I'm going to remind you about all the good stuff we have for you so you don't get bogged down and you don't get stuck. Then really quick, we're going to explain pseudocode again, and we're going to go look at the things that we looked at on Thursday. Thursday, I mean to say Tuesday. Those things being while loops and then counting operations. We're going to discuss counting operations again, but this time we're going to do an example. So we're going to do basically an example uh, where we have the pseudocode for factorial and go through that. Um, the very last thing we're going to do is I'm going to look forward to week three, and we're going to look at the tool installation guide because next week is when we expect you to have Java on your systems, be it a laptop, be it a desktop at home, or something like that. So we'll talk about that ever so briefly. Tool guide is right there on the lecture page, and you'll be able to look at that stuff, all right? So where do I want to be? I do not want to be there. I want to be here, Canvas site, okay? You got Professor Centeno's welcome video. You have the link to the syllabus website, which is great. So this is what you need to know. Your resources here, down here is where you found the links to this particular video. You have Piazza, okay? Click on that and Piazza gets loaded up. You can see all of that right there. Tutoring, when tutoring is getting going next week, this is where you're going to see the administration for it. Penji Tutoring, you'll get instructions on that, all right? You're already learning that modules is where you find a lot of stuff about your recitations. i got to be careful now because I might see more than you see at this point because recitations are all up there. Grade scope, if you took the Scarlet exam, you're getting used to that. We're going to talk about your first assignment, which is released today, okay? Announcements, if you don't get them sent to you, which you should, so go to notifications and change that. But this is where you can go and look for announcements. All right. So campus page, a lot of resources there. Place you're going to start. Enough said. Now you click on website there and you get the syllabus website. And as I've said before, and you've heard me say it, this is basically the instructions for the entire class, this page. You've got the book. You've got instructions about assignments. You've got instructions about grading and regrades how the course works, the grading structure, 500 points for assignments, 50 for recitations, 450 for exams. Two exams, one final. Done. Okay? How you get those points and how the course is laid out is all here now. You know all the dates now. So get it in a calendar, look at it, plan ahead. I always tell people, half of this course is organization. It's a lot of stuff. If you wrap your head around it early, you read all the websites, you get all the dates down, then you're going to be fine. I want you worrying about computer science, and I want you worrying about Java. I don't want you worrying about when this is going to happen, how this is going to happen, all the different websites, okay? Right now, just read this and worry about the first assignment. So right now, you're worried about grade scope. Lectures. All the lectures for the course are laid out already, okay? Like I told you, you're at the beginning of a week. Next week's going to be week three. So I look over here. I have textbook readings. I read sections 1.1 and 1.2 in my Java book. Then I look at the lecture slides, okay? 
Soon we're going to get you code for book videos. There's going to be a Java reference sheet now. We're going to look at that tool installation guide at the end of class today or at the end of this video, whatever. All right. Once you've read the textbook, once you've done the slides, once you've gone to lecture, you come over here and click that triangle and you look at the learning objectives. That's the key. If you understand the learning objectives, you are good. If you don't, then find out what you don't know, look, read what you don't know, and go back and find it in the book, in the slides, in the lectures, and review. If you are still hazy, cat's tutors, okay? Ask about it in recitation. Talk to your classmates. Talk to your LA. Piazza. Ask a question on Piazza. Could be anonymous. You don't have to say who you are at Piazza, right? Go to the cave, ask the iLab assistants, go, you know, see what some other 111 students are thinking. Use the resources, lots of resources. We don't want you getting stuck. Once you're through all the learning objectives, you're good. You're good to go. That's where we get the exam questions from. That's where we get the assignments from, okay? So if you know the let's, the reason you're there, that's the synchronon of the whole operation right there. So. You know those learning objectives. You are in good shape. All right. Assignments. Pseudocode. You can see it is released. Click on it. And you will get the instructions for pseudocode. Pseudocode is done, if I'm not mistaken, in grade scope. Okay. The link's not there because they want you going through Canvas when you do it. Because if you don't, maybe you're not logged in properly and things go a little kooky. So know that okay all the dates are here for all your assignments when they're going to be open if you need to know here's all the rules about handing things in late when you can hand things late a cop that's also on the front page so you're good there exams look at that all there we already know the dates already have practice exams things are all there ready you know the story i told you the story about common hour exams so we're going to get you that time back don't worry about it okay very last every time we do this and i'm making good time this is the page with the instructors if you need to email us that's where you can get our emails more importantly office hours that's yet another resource you can avail yourself of everybody's office hours are down here okay Professor Gunna does his online. I do mine online. If you go during these times, Tuesday, 11 to 1, and you click on online, you will go to my WebEx meeting room, and I will be there, okay? And we can have office hours, all right? Those are the two main websites you want to know about. You want to know about Canvas? You definitely want to know about the Intro CS Syllabus website, okay? And... Perhaps because of the Scarlet Test or now because of this pseudocode assignment, you're going to get familiar with Gradescope. All right. So Gradescope is going to be a tool that you use as well. The next time you deal with Gradescope is when you go to look at the results of your first exam because exams will be uploaded to Gradescope. And that's what the graders will use to access it, review your exams and grade your exams. I don't want to get ahead of the game. I'm trying to do this in a timely manner. So it doesn't take all day. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Yes, let's do this. All right. To really quick jump into some of the material we were talking about Tuesday, we were talking about pseudocode. Remember, pseudocode is how we're going to get used to writing programs algorithmic recipes that we're going to use in order to give instructions to a computer to have the computer solve problems for us but remember we speak in natural language the computer speaks in ones and zeros so we need a go-between right so what we do is we find what we're going to call a high-level programming language a subset of words okay with rules about how you can use them syntax so we have rigid syntax, a limited amount of words that we can use, and we do this to craft our solutions. If you remember, I likened it to a recipe. You have your ingredients, your recipe alters those ingredients until you get to a goal state. 
And we kind of call that imperative programming, where you're going to have your data, and then you're going to have a series of steps that examine slash alter that data until you get to the, your solution, your goal state, right? And different languages work in different ways, your Javas, your Cs, your Rust, your all these things. But at first, we don't want to get bogged down and get specific right away. We want you to get a general overall gist of how we put programs together. Because at the end of the day, it's kind of weird. And the reason it's weird, and just like all computer science, it's not hard. It's just weird. And you get through weird by spending a lot of time with it. Anyway, here, we want you to get a sense of how we write programs because it's different. Your entire life you've been writing for the sake of communication, writing that note for the fridge, the email, right? Writing that paper. Now you're kind of writing in a different way. It's functional writing. You're writing down instructions that are going to be followed. So it has to be in a certain format. It has to be precise. And there's certain things that we're going to do that you're going to get used to that basically all programming languages are going to feature. Things like reading and data, working with variables. Just Tuesday we talked about iteration and loops with while loops. Those things are going to be features that you're going to see in all the languages that you're going to work with. Okay? So here, just as a high meta level, remember, it's, it's general. It's not anything specific here. Different people can use different kinds of pseudocode. We just want to go high level and have a way to describe how we would craft a program. Then next week, we're going to take this pseudocode, whoop, we're going to turn it into Java, and we're going to, going to show you how the, the computer can then run the Java, all right? So here, we look at read to read in data. We look at display to display results. Set is where we can give a variable a value. Compute is where we can take an arithmetic and expression and evaluate it and then take that solution and put it into a variable. So we have some of those tools. The first thing we get to that's kind of powerful, I may as well go to that slide, is if then else, where you craft a Boolean expression which is something that's either true or false. And depending on the result of that, you can do a command or not, okay? The way you create a Boolean expression is with relational operators, greater than, less than, equal to, not equal to, okay? So you craft that Boolean expression and then you test it with an if statement. If it's true, you do something. If it's not, you skip that whole block, okay? Now, the trick there is that if you want to make it a binary situation, you use the else. So if something's true, do this. That way, if it's not true, you do the second thing. Okay? We gloss over it quickly, like I've said, but it's actually pretty powerful. It's the first time in computer programming where you're not just adding two numbers together and putting them out. It's the first thing that's post-calculator, let's say, okay? And it's pretty important because what you're doing is you're analyzing data now. You're creating a test with a relational operator. Is X greater than 10? Is X greater than 100? Does X equal 98.6? Okay? And if that's true, then we do something. So you're basically analyzing data for certain criteria, and if that's true, you're acting upon it. It's pretty powerful, even though at first we go over it quickly and it's simple. So you have if then, and you have if then else, and, and Boolean statements that can be evaluated to true or false, okay? And we started out by creating programs with these commands and these commands only. We then came to learn about the Boolean operators and they can put together Boolean expressions, okay? And we quickly looked at a truth table, whereas if you have a Boolean expression, a Boolean expression and an and in between, then they both have to be true for the whole thing to be true. With the or, Boolean expression or Boolean expression, only one of them has to be true for the entire expression to be true and so on. So be weary of that. And we're going to obviously get to that and talk about it again when we get to counting operations. But when we initially did this, we did gloss over one thing. Where did I, is it 25? It is 25. And that one thing is the while loop. 
And the while loop is where you're also going to use a Boolean expression, but in a different way. You're going to use the while keyword or command, right? And you're going to examine a statement, all right? And if that statement is true, then you go into what we call the while loop in here, and whatever statements are in there, you will execute. Then you'll get to a keyword that says end while. And what that means is you're going to go back to the top, right back to the while statement, and you're going to test that Boolean expression again. If it's still true, you're going to repeat the instructions. End while, go back to the top. Still true? Yes. Do the instructions, end while. And because you go like that, we call it a loop. You're going to come to know it as iteration. Okay? When you finally get to the point where you go up to the while and you test that Boolean expression and it's false, then you will stop and you'll go to the very next command after the end while. Okay? Here in this example, I use set to create a variable called n, and I set it to 10. Then I set a variable called sum to 0. Then I use a while loop. While n is greater than 0, it is, it's 10. I compute sum as sum plus n. Okay, we did a truncated version of this on Tuesday. We only went up to 5. So I did subtract 1 from n after that, so my 10 becomes a 9. And then I go end while. So I come up to the while. Is 9 greater than 0? It is. And I repeat the process. Okay? And then I take 1 from n and it goes to 8. I will continue to do this until I subtract 1 from n and it becomes 0. End while. I go to the while. Is 0 greater than 0? It is not. That's false. Okay? So at that point, I will jump down and I will end the while. But what we did inside there is we added every number together from n to 0 to find the sum. And 1 to 10, was that 55? So that's what that particular piece of code did. The one thing I want you to get out of that example is the subtract line. Okay, because when you go into that while loop initially, that condition is true. Here's the key. Something in the loop needs to alter that variable or that condition in some way so that you converge towards it eventually being false. Because if it's always true, you're going to get into an endless loop. And that's a problem when you're writing a program. What you're going to want to do is create a situation like you've done here where it does the work you want to do, but eventually that's going to be false so you can then get out of the loop. Okay? So be weary of that. You're always going to want to have something in that while loop that eventually gets you to a false condition. All right? And we're going to talk about that in maybe five minutes when we start talking about counting operations. So that's how the while loop is set up. Again, even in these slides, you're going to see things like for loops. You're going to see things like repeat until. It's all variations of this. Just worry about this. Once we get down the line and we start looking at for loops, I'm going to show you. They're just while loops. They're just while loops in a different format. You're just putting things in different places. Repeat until, it's just taking the while and putting it at the bottom instead of the top. Okay, so they're all riffs on this. This is what you want to know. All right. The important thing is I look at a condition. Is it true? Then I do a block of commands. It could be one command. It could be a block of commands. Okay. Then I get to the end of that. I go back to the top and I look at the condition again. All right. So make sure you've got that one thing here at subtract one from n that's eventually going to get your condition so that the condition is false and you jump out of that while loop okay all right this is these are slide one right i want to be slide two all right this is where i want to be but before i want to be here i want to be here and just remind you read these slides because at the very beginning we talk about flow charting and pseudocode and then eventually programming code 
I told you the long, boring old man story on Tuesday about how I had to wait in line at the computer lab to get my printout. And then if I made a dumb mistake, oh, my God, I had to go back, log in, change it, rerun it, get back in line. It was a long, tedious process. So planning and design were a lot more important for me in the 80s when I'm doing my computer science degree. You have a processor in front of you of your very own, you're lousy with memory, you have all of this stuff, you're okay with rapid prototyping, right? Quick whipping something up, trying it, and in an iterative design process, changing it, changing it, changing it until it works well for you. That said, it's never a bad idea to do a flow chart. If an algorithm isn't working the way you think it should be working or things are going weird, take a step back. And look at some of these design things like flow charting, like pseudocode. You can see here how, how a design with a flow chart can then go to pseudocode once you're at pseudocode. And you're going to see this next week. You can go from pseudocode to Java or the language you're learning very easily. And, we're, and so basically what that's going to prove to us is anything we can do in pseudocode, we can then get into our language like java in the real world and start solving problems with it okay so don't sleep on the design stuff it's good and if you can design something and you can see that it works you can always translate that to either pseudocode or java code okay it's easy process and we're going to show you all that all right what slide am i oh i didn't i jumped away from that slide i think was it 12 yes okay I kind of already did it with the other one, but I did want to come up here. And it's good to show you again because I'll remind you about tracing. What we're going to do here is we're going to trace this program as it runs through. And this is actually a good way to test algorithms and test the programs you write. So basically what this is here is very similar to what we just looked at on the while loops. But look at that. Dun, dun, dun. Instead of plus, it is multiplication. So instead of summation, we're going to be doing factorial because it's going to multiply, multiply, multiply. All right. So we're going to start out with the value N being four and basically run through the program. Do I have? Yes, I do. A text box ready to go. Amazing preparation. So read N. Let's say N is four. All right. I'm going to give N a four. Set result to one. Boom. It's a one. While N is greater than one. It is. It's four. Compute result as result times n. So result times n is 4, and that's what it says to set result for. So I will do that. And then it says subtract 1 from n. So n is going to become 3. Okay? End while. Go back to the top. While n is greater than 1, n is 3, certainly is greater than 1. Compute result as result times n. So, result, which is 4, times n is now 12. Subtract 1 from n. Will do. No worries. I will make that a 2. Okay? End while. Jump up to the while. While n, 2, Greater than 1. Is is it greater than 1? It certainly is. So I jump back in. Compute result as result times n. Result times n, 24. Okay. Subtract 1 from n. Uh-oh. I did that wrong. Okay. So now n is 1. End while. While n is greater than 1, it's not. It's false. 1 is equal to 1. 1 isn't greater than 1. So this condition is now false. I do not execute the commands in the loop again. I jump to the end while and go to the next command. And unlike the summation we did the other day, here I print the result. And the result is 24. Okay? That's the correct answer. n was the input for a program that computed factorial. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is indeed 24. Okay? So tracing through the different variables and noting when they change their state 
as you go through is a good way to test your algorithms, see if you understand exactly what's going on. It will come in handy for you later when you take exams because when you sit for exams in a computer science course, they're like 80 minutes. You're not going to have time to write comp entire programs from scratch during this time, and we know that. So what we're going to do a lot of times is give you sample code, examples of code, and we're going to ask you, hey, if this initial variable is something, what would the result be? Well, if you know how to trace and you have practice doing that, that's easy. You just take all the variables, you make a column for them, and you go through the program. You trace through the logic, changing the variables as they change. When you get to the end, you could look at what they are. When this particular piece of code ended, n was 1, result was 24. And result is what had the solution that we wanted. Okay? All right. The... Third thing we want to do, 20, yes, is start talking about counting operations. And if you remember Tuesday, we started talking about, I guess, what you would call efficiency, all right? And later, later down the road for you prospective CS majors and minors, you're going to get involved in what's called complexity, and you're going to want to look at how efficient your programs are okay remember there are certain problems that we can't solve we want to make sure you learn how to recognize those so you don't pull your hair out there are other problems that we can theoretically solve but we don't have enough space or time in the known universe to solve them you will learn about combinatorial explosion and some things like that but then there's another level where okay we have problems that we can solve but computer programming being a nonlinear activity, there's a lot of different ways that we can solve these problems. How do I know what the best one is? And when I say the best, eh, how, what's the most efficient? Is it the one that runs the most quickly? Is it the one that uses the least amount of space? Is it, you know, I don't know. I'm. How do I tell? Okay. You're going to find later when we start worrying about these things that we're mostly worried about time and space. And for whatever reason, you're going to spend a little bit more, more effort on time than on space. So what we do here is we make an assumption. We make an assumption that every operation in our pseudocode is the same unit of time. Boop. Like if you learn about high performance computing, you learn about flops and teraflops and all and petaflops and all that stuff. Flop is just a floating point operation. We're going to make the assumption. It's not an assumption there. It's true there. But here in our pseudocode world, we're going to say that one operation is the same unit of time. So if you could craft an algorithm that gets the correct answer, it's kind of the definition of an algorithm. If you give it good data, it's always going to give you an answer. If I can craft that with 14 steps, and there's another algorithm that also comes to the answer, the proper answer, all the time, and it's only 10 steps, well, then I think at this level we can safely say that that second algorithm is the better one. Okay. Now, in the real world, there might be other contextual things you want to look at. Is it using too much space? Is it doing other things? I don't know. Okay? But for our purposes here, we want to look at our pseudocode solutions and start counting operations to see how we can make sure that we're at least more efficient than some other algorithm. Okay? Okay? Like if you wanted to create an algorithm that displayed something to the screen 100 times, right? Well, you could write a program that had 100 display commands. It would print it to the screen. Or you could do a while loop with a display inside of it, set a variable to 100, and just take one away from it every time. Okay? You're still gonna do 100 print operations right but it's probably more efficient to do it in a loop than to type the whole thing out right 
Um, there's a bunch of different ways to think about efficiency and think about what you're doing because the instance I just gave you, your operations are probably going to be similar at the end of the day, but you wouldn't want to do the code where you have to write the display command a hundred times. Okay. I'm getting into the weeds. Let's look at some examples. Well, no, we're not going to look at examples first. We're going to talk about the four different cases when you're counting operations. I can see I'm already up to a half hour, so I got to get my button gear. First of all, right here on this slide that I have on the screen, you're going to see these six commands that you first have there. They're all one operation. So when you see them, right out of the box, one operation. And we're going to go back and do this with factorial, so don't worry about it. The second thing you have to worry about is the things on the right, okay? Those are not operations. So when you see a line with those words, you're good to go. Don't worry about it. You don't have to count them, okay? They're more like fence posts, or you're going to come to call them delimiters. They're more like things that tell you when to stop, okay? So they're not operations. The other two you need to think about. The one, if statements, you need to count the total number of compares. And if you remember, we looked at our Boolean expressions. If you have two expressions put together with an and or two expressions put together with an or, you need to count both. Okay. And as we discussed, even with the or, if the first one is true, we're not going to shortcut. We're going to do both. Okay. So if you see however many comparisons that you see after an if statement, even if they're put together with Boolean operators, you count an operation for each one. Okay. The fourth one and the one that you really need to pay the most attention to is how we handle while loops. Okay. The example we're going to go back and do the factorial is a while loop because I want you to see that. Basically, the secret sauce is this. The comparison for the while loop is one operation. Whatever's inside the while loop is one operation. If they, you know, follow the other rules, like if there's a read in there, it's one. If there's an end if in there, it doesn't count. All that, follow the rules. And then the end while is not, but here's the rub. Then you go back to the top of the while loop. However many times you iterate through the loop is how many operations that you do. So let's say you have a while loop that has two commands in the block. Comparison, command, command. So that's three times. So every time you go through, it's three operations. All right? Until, and this is the thing to remember, eventually that comparison for the while statement is going to be false. You need to count that as an operation because the comparison is being made. It will make more sense in a second. So when you're doing a while loop, you want to have the comparison and the commands inside the loop, however many times you go through the loop, and then add one to it, because eventually that condition has to fail. Let's go look at a solid example on that. Hey, hey, why is my mouse not working? There we go. All right, so I'm back here. I'm going to count operations, all right? Read. One operation. Set. One operation. While. So I'm not going to do it there. I'm going to do it over here because I know I'm going to have to repeat them. That's one operation because it's a comparison. The n greater than one. Okay? Compute. Why am I not being allowed in there? There we go. Ah. That's one. Subtract. That's one. Okay? And then end while, which I know is nothing. So that's going to be three operations. So then my display here at the very end of the program, that's one. All right. So how do I handle regular commands? Read, that's an operation. Set, that's an operation. Display, that's an operation. So what I'm going to have, should I do it over here? Yeah, I might as well because I can do it there. What I'm going to have is I'm going to have one and one and one. And if I want to make my life easy, three operations. So whenever I run this, for whatever n is, I'm always going to have those three. I'm always going to have the read. I'm always going to have the set. 
and I'm always going to have the display, right? Then I go to the while loop. I have my comparison, I have my compute, and I have my subtract, okay? So I'm always going to have three times something, okay? Let's say right now we'll just call it n because I don't know how many times I'm going to iterate through the thing. So I'm kind of using a general solution, okay? Then, because I'm doing a while loop, I need to remember that that thing's going to be false at the end of the process. And that's an operation, okay? So at the end of the day, if I give my algorithm, let's say, a 2, okay, read, let's actually do that, and I'll do it right here. Read is 1. Set result to read n, which is n is going to be 2. Set result to 1, that's 1. While n, which is 2, is greater than 1, that's an operation. Compute, operation. What it does is it takes results times... Result times n, which makes result 2, okay? Then I'm going to subtract 1 from it, operation. End while, go to the top. Is n, is 1 greater than 1? It is not, it's false, but I did the comparison, so I have to count it. That's my false. Then I go to the end while, and I display the result, Okay? So how many did I count off there? That's seven. Operations. That I counted. Okay. So here I go back to my general formula. And I say three plus three times N. What was N? How many times did I go through the loop? Once. Right. So three times one is three plus one is seven. And that's what we got. Let me leave this 7 there so it's not confusing. Okay? Now, if I had done it with a 3, we would have gone through the loop an extra time. So it would have been 10. Right? Because it would have been an extra time through the loop. N would have been 2. So that would have gotten multiplied by 3. 6 plus 3 plus 1 is 10. Okay? I hope... That isn't confusing, and that's not making you crazy, because I don't know at the beginning how many times I'm going to go through the loop, because as someone who's trying to evaluate that pseudocode, I don't always know what n's going to be, but I know every time I have to go through the loop, then I'm going to have what, oh, you know what, another thing is, I'm using uppercase n here, but lowercase n, we're using the same variable. I don't want to do that. So actually, you could, you, if you use the lowercase value, whatever it is, you could do that because it was 2, but we're comparing it to greater than 1, not greater than 0. So whatever the value is, you're going to go through the loop that many times minus 1. Right. So if N is 10, you're only going through nine times because once you get down to one, you're no good. It's not going down to zero. Oh, God, I hope you understand that. Anyway, you could do it like this. OK. So that's what we're talking about with counting operations with while loops. You have to count the operations for every iteration, but then add one because the test is eventually going to fail. All right. All right, go back, read the slides, look at the examples, practice with this. I'm sure in recitation next week, and your pseudocode assignment isn't due till next Friday. So I don't think you have to bang it out tonight. And if you don't understand everything, you're in bad shape. Not the case. You're going to go to recitation next week, and you're going to review this stuff. And you're going to get some experience, and you're going to see some examples of some more while loops that get run through. And you're going to understand all this stuff. All right? So no worries, no consternation, not allowed. The last thing I want to do is I want to, no, no, yes, 
All right. Next week, for the first time, we're going to start doing Java. All right. So what next week we're going to at the labs in the cave, we're going to have install fest and the tutors can help you. And but what we need to do is we need to do two things. We need to put Java on your machines to use and we need to put Visual Studio Code or another what we call IDE or Integrated Development Environment. It's just an editor for programs. OK, like Word is an editor for your papers or Excel is an editor for spreadsheets. Well, an IDE is an editor for your programs. That's all it means. In this course, we use Visual Studio Code. So we have a tool installation guide down here on the right side by week three. And if you click on that, it will explain where Java is. OK, you can use click on that and you'll get the Oracle version. You can use Java 20. You can use 17. You want to make sure you see JDK because that's a Java development kit. OK, you don't want what's just called a JRE or a Java runtime environment. You want the JDK which is 20, okay? Oracle may, when you download it, they may ask you to log in or create a user ID or something like that. It's all free. So you can go get it and it's not a problem. That said, you can use OpenJDK as well. As a matter of fact, I think the iLabs and AutoLab, which is what you're gonna be doing your thing, your assignments with, also uses JDK. It's gonna be the same thing. Because what we're doing is the basics. And the basics are the same no matter what version you use. You could use JDK 11, frankly. All right. Um, oh, one thing I didn't tell you. I do want to make mention just so you're not confused. You're going to see here JDK 20 and JDK 17. And you're going to like, what the hell happened to 18 and 19? Things like that. JDK 17 it's what's called an LTS or a long-term support version. Sometimes people don't feel like upgrading their software every eight months or every year or whenever a new version comes out, especially if you're making something that you're going to, you know, sell commercially and things like that. You want something that's stable, something that's always going to be the same version for a while. So most people, Python, Java, who are distributing programming languages will have what's called a long-term support version. They'll pick one version and they'll go, you know what, we're going to support this one as is for a really long time. 17 is the long-term support version. Okay. 20 represents more of the latest and the greatest. Okay. Any new improvements that have been made in the last couple of years, that'll be in the JDK 20. That said, it doesn't matter to us. We're doing some simple things. Like I say, we're using a simple subset of Java in order to teach you about computer science. We're not really here to turn you into Java programmers. We're not going to talk about Swing. We're not going to talk about Enterprise Java Beans or any such stuff. All right? All right. So that's where you would go get the Java. Read the whole page. It's good. Look at all the different resources. There's setup information for Windows, for Mac. Like if you go to the Java page here, make sure you click on Windows or Mac over here and you don't look at the Linux stuff, all right? Windows would be here. Microsoft installers, packages and stuff like that are all there for you. If you're Mac, Mac is right there. It's all going to be there, all right? And get me back to my resource page. All right, the other thing, oh, actually here. I still have videos up that I did a while ago about how to use the iLab machines and how you can actually log into an iLab machine and get a graphical user interface and use Visual Studio Code on the lab machines. Okay, That's the answer for people who have Chromebooks. That's the answer for people who are you know lost their laptop, their laptop, their dog ate their homework, and their laptop fell down a sewer grate. And you're, I can't do my homework now. Yes, you can. You can log into the iLab machines. Everybody in CS111 has an iLab account. And it's you're a CS student, so you have the right to an iLab account. You should definitely set it up and use it because you can learn about Linux. You can do your homework there. It's a really good thing. Those two videos that I have linked to up there 
will show you how to do these things. Apache Guacamole is great. It's just – it's like in your web browser, you see the same interface you would see if you were in the iLabs logged into a machine in front of you. It's a really good deal, okay? Visual Studio Code, you go grab it from there, okay? There's a bunch of different versions out there, Visual Studio Code 2022, a bunch of other stuff, blah, blah, blah. This is probably your best bet right here, version 1.82, okay? I don't, I don't know the first idea what version mine is. Or I'm an old man. I'm running 1.78. I don't know. I'm guessing I'm going to be okay, though. All right? So you're going to want the two things. You're going to want Java installed on your system and then Visual Studio Code, which is the editor or the IDE. Okay? I'm already at 47. So I may as well. Should I do a Hello World and go the hour? Should I do it? All right. When you get Visual Studio Code fired up you are going to see this okay if you do on the resource page the java extensions you will have it see java let's see command palette java configure runtime that's project attempt. do i need a project all right i'm starting from scratch i'm gonna go file open folder I'm going to grab a new folder. I'm going to start from scratch and put everything in a blank folder. So where is this? My desktop? Do I want to do this? My just call. I'll call it hello. No. All right. Don't call it that. Go to area 51. Do I have a hello here? I do not. So I want to select a folder. Right? Let me create a folder in here. No, that says open folder. What is going on? Open file, open folder. Area 51, new folder. I will call it hello. And I will select that folder. Ah, alert the media, it worked. Now, I've created a folder on my hard drive and I'm looking at its contents right here. It's empty because I just created it. So now I'm going to say new text file. And I'm going to jump over here. And it gives me a blank file. Okay. Now you don't have to know this yet. But you will at some point. Class hello. Public. Boy. Name. String. Do it there. Arcs. Oops. All right. Call me crazy. Looks good to me. Control S is going to let me save. I'm going to call it hello.java. All right. I want to see a terminal down there so I can run this at the command line. Thank you. Now, if you remember what we talked about last week, how... We get those ones and zeros by running a program. And sometimes you run a program that interprets every time. Sometimes you run a program that translates and gives you something you can use every time. The ones and zeros that you're actually going to use. And we're going to discuss the reasons why and, and how next week. So don't let this bog you down. But with Java, we kind of do both. So the first thing we do is we're going to compile our program to what we call bytecode or something that's kind of in the middle. And then we're going to interpret our bytecode. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a program called Java C, Java compiler. And I want it to look at my hello.java program, which I have up there. So when it does that, you can see over here in my file listing, it created a file called hello.class. That's the intermediate bytecode that we can now interpret by just saying Java. 
So Java C will compile and create this intermediate bytecode. Okay, that's always there. We don't have to run Java C again now. But every time I want to run my program, I am going to have to interpret the bytecode. So I'm going to say Java, hello, and the class is implied, so I don't need to put it. And it's going to say hello world. Okay, so now I'm not, obviously I can't type that fast. I'm hitting the up arrow and the terminal goes and grabs the last command. If I want to run it again, I can run it again. If I want to wait a couple minutes, run it again. I can run it again, right? This is a program. So what if I want to change things? What if I come up here to my code and I say, Hola mundo, tu sabes? And now I want to save my program again. But here's a trick. I, is it easy? Can I show you just as easy? Yes. Go click auto save. Oh, it's the best thing in the world because then you can forget about saving all the time. If I had a dollar for every time when I was a kid that I typed 100 lines of code and then forgot to save and it all got blown away, I would be a wealthy, wealthy man. Hit auto save and it automatically saves for you. OK, so now I've changed my code. I come down here to the terminal. I can type clear and it lets me start again from the top. Now, I've made a change, so I want to change my bytecode and rerun the compiler. So I'm going to say Java C, hello.java again, and then I'm going to interpret my new bytecode. That's going to say hola mundo, okay? Just a little taste, all right? We're going to go through the installation process. Next Tuesday, we are going to go through this hello world again. Next Tuesday, we are going to start taking our uh, Java, uh, Java, our pseudocode, and we are going to start turning it into Java programs next week. And we're going to start with the very basics of learning to code in Java, things like if then else in Java, things like data types, okay? Actually, week four is conditionals and loops. Next week is gonna be simple statements, data types, different things like that. So next week, we're finally there. We're gonna get going with Java and we're gonna slowly but surely build up the skills we have with our programming languages because the more you learn, the more problems you can solve. And that's gonna be the interesting part. That's where the computer science comes in. So we're going to talk about different aspects of Java and the Java programming language next week. All right. I'm going to end this thing. Of course, I went longer than I wanted to because I gab. Pre prepare for next week by reading the two chapters that you're supposed to read in the book, 1.1, 1.2. OK, and then do your best to go to the tool. Uh, I'm not even going to. right here the tool um what do we call it the tool guide the tool re the tool installation guide I, I, i'll leave it on the antibiotics today but i don't think it is i think i'm getting old and crummy come here learn about this stuff put java on there like when i show you open jdk and java development kit it's basically installing the java c program it's installing the java program OK, that all comes along when you get a JDK or a Java development kit that allows you to write your own Java programs. All right. And, and it's free. It's actually pretty cool. There's a lot, a lot of great stuff in computer science and computing that's free. OK. And once you understand what the free stuff is, you can usually go out and then get your free editors, free programming languages, all kinds of different things you can avail yourself of because now you're a tech person. OK, so you're going to be in really good shape. Do that. Read the book. OK, look at the slides to prepare. And then if you can do a little bit to try and get Java installed on your system. When you come to class on Tuesday, we're going to jump right in and we're going to talk about the installation process because there's a couple of different tips and tricks for Windows systems and Mac systems. And then we're going to jump right in and do a hello world and start talking about data types. And we're going to 
really jump for those of you who said, oh, boy, we're, we're starting a little slow with the pseudocode stuff. Pseudocode is necessary because you need to understand why you're doing programming this way. That's the, a lot of people skip that, and students get crummy understandings of why we program the way we do. But now we're going to be taking our pseudocode, we're going to be moving over and turning it into Java, and we're going to start doing Java code, and then once we're there, we could really get into the computer science. All right? All right. I can't imagine a scenario where I'm not at lecture next Tuesday. So thank you for allowing me to, to give you a lecture this particular class in this format. All right. I, I am a big, big do it in person guy. So the fact I'm sitting here recording this sucks, frankly. But que sera, Have a great, great weekend. OK, beat Virginia Tech. So we could be three and oh, not too shabby. All right. So we could be three and oh and have dreams and hopes before we go to Michigan. And then I will see you on Tuesday next week. All right. Take care. Be good.